everyone. Welcome back to the 3 o'clock talk today on Sunday in Los Angeles City. First, a word from our sponsor. OpenSUSE is a proud uh, sponsor and uh, is um, proud to sponsor Scale and the presenter you will hear from today. Use your OpenQA uh, for fully automated testing framework and for big data. You can have a one-click install with OpenSUSE factories. OpenStack, R, Ceph, Redis, IPython, and more are all available with OpenSUSE. Hack with us and build big data around OpenSUSE, which is based on the same technologies that SUSE uses. Um, and now for a talk, it's Ian McLeod uh, presenting Linux Charcuterie, How the Distribution Sausage is Made. And um, you'll find a link on the back of your badge. If you could please share your opinions with us on the speaker survey, we'd appreciate that. Thanks. Or not, you know, <laughs> depending. <laughs> so thank you, SUSE. Uh, my name is Ian McLeod, and thank everyone here for sticking around until almost the bitter end. Uh, I appreciate it. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, my name is Ian McLeod. I'm a developer at Red Hat. And I have this cheekily named presentation called Linux Charcuterie, How Distribution Sausage is Made. Let's start with a definition. Um, so charcuterie is uh, prepared meat. Uh, you probably already noticed that there's a bit of inaccuracy in what I said. Charcuterie isn't just sausage. It's also some other prepared meats. Um, they're all delicious in my experience, uh, and they're primarily made from pork. So um, bailout opportunity number one, I am not actually here to talk about pork products. So if that <laughs> was genuinely what you understood the subject to be, um, I won't be offended if you leave. Um, but uh, what I did want to make sure, and I don't, you know, not everybody necessarily knows the little slang I'm using here, but this is a reference to uh, a joke that you don't always want to know how the sausage is made because you might not want to eat it anymore. Um, and I, I'm actually, I'm from Chicago, so there's a history of, way to go, um, unappetizing sausage production techniques that's associated with Chicago. But, right. <laughs> no. But this is about something that's not at all like that. So the analogy breaks down almost immediately. Um, the idea actually came from a coworker of mine, Joe Brockmeyer, who, uh, like me, has been a very long time user of a variety of Linux distributions, but acknowledged that he didn't have a clear idea of uh, how these things, yeah, what did I get? The, uh, the individual details of how these things are made, the actual nuts and bolts of how you go from a big collection of open source software uh, to something that you can get on an ISO or on a USB stick. Um, and I realized that until two or three years ago, even though I've been at Red Hat since 2001, uh, I've been using Linux since 1996, and I honestly didn't know a lot of the nuts and bolts details myself. I'd installed many Linux many times. I knew how to build individual components, but I had no idea how uh, the big collection of software is actually put together and becomes a distribution. So that's what I'm hoping to talk about here. I, I think that that's something that's very important. It's not unsavory at all. It isn't about making bad sausage. It's about making great sausage. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of ashamed, actually, and I think it's unfortunate that uh, Someone like me or someone like Joe didn't know more about it, so um, hopefully we'll remedy that a little bit here. Hey, Joe, that's Joe, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Brockmeyer, the originator of this, uh, JZB or Zonker, as some of you may know him. So um, very briefly, I'm going to talk about this, as you might have noticed from uh, some of the material on this slide template, in the context of Fedora. So I'm going to try and talk about um, the construction of a Fedora release from start to finish at a pretty reasonable level of detail. Um, I'll go on to compare that a little bit with some other distributions. Uh, I want to emphasize that this is not a competitive comparison. This is not meant to be combative. One of them is SUSE, or rather OpenSUSE. I've had a great talk with some of the people involved in OpenSUSE uh, distributions. Uh, talk a little bit about it, Debian as well. Uh, and then finally, I'll touch on a few things that are changing the criteria by which we decide what actually goes into a distribution, what it is, um, you know, and, and how that might change things going forward. So this is at a level of detail where I hope if you're a user but not someone who's necessarily contributed to the distribution construction process, you might find it interesting. So if you've installed an RPM but haven't built one or haven't created one from scratch, for example, that's going to be interesting to you. If you are actually, for example, the Fedora project lead, like Matt Miller, you might find some of this redundant, um, but you can correct me where I'm wrong. So. And I hope by the end that you, as I said, will understand and appreciate what distributions do and maybe even be interested in contributing to the process. That's something that I've started to be able to do myself inside of Fedora. So
So I have uh, a, a pure sausage gimmick here uh, going along with it. So I have two pictures of sausage. This is number one of two. If anyone can give me correctly identify this, uh, I will give you a Girl Scout cookie. Uh, or whoever answers first, even if they're wrong, if nobody else gets it right, I'll give you Girl Scout cookies. And we have thin, we have thin mints. No, it's a specific type. So we have thin mints. What's it? Blood sausage. No, it's not blood sausage. Any? We'll maybe do one or two more. It is um, saucisson sec. It's dried pork sausage. Uh, it's it's primarily French. I I wish I had never been introduced to it. It's delicious. Uh, so do you want thin mints or peanut butter? All right. that, boy, that was a stupid <laughs> question. <laughs> I, these are my favorite, actually. So, All right, that's gimmick number one out of the way. Thank you, Sue. So I thought I would frame this, uh, the fedora portion of the summary, uh, with something that was very loosely inspired by an improvisational comedy technique that funny people do, not me, um, where they take audience suggestions and then they construct a 60-second play and then they compress it over and over again until they're performing it in one second. So we're instead going to start at 60 seconds and then blow up out. OK, cool. This is <laughs> the play. There is no actual play. It's just an idea. <laughs> so here's the Fedora release process. I got this just, just for this talk, so I'm going to use that. No, I won't use that yet. So here it is. And none of this is meant to make sense right now. The hope is that at the end, when we look at this again, it will make sense to people. So the old release is branched. Uh, this is the only slide I'm going to read directly, by the way. I apologize. No, you're not supposed to do that. The old release is branched. Rawhide accumulates packages and updates, which are tracked in package DB and Bodhi, and stored in Distjit and built in Koji. Dist git, sorry. <laughs> the upcoming release is branched. So the upcoming release is, say, F22. New features are completed or dropped. Progressive release criteria are added prior to alpha, beta, and GA releases. Test composers and release candidates are generated and evaluated against these criteria. And if all deliverables meet the criteria, the milestone is released. When the milestone is GA, Fedora is released and we are done. And so we start over. Matt, is that accurate? Yeah. All right, fantastic. It's a good start. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we have a journalist in the room, ladies and gentlemen, and an editor. Um, what is missing from this, moving on, is a whole accumulation of tools and processes going back, I think it's fair to say, at least 20 years, actually, in the Linux space. And so we'll start to look at these. The first of them, which is really central to essentially any sizable distribution, uh, with the possible exception of Gentoo, which doesn't, I think, doesn't really believe in this. Um, that's not, again, this is not a judgmental thing. It's just, uh, is packaging. So who, who here is uh, familiar with RPM packaging? Who has installed an RPM? Who has rebuilt an RPM? Okay. And who has created an RPM from scratch? Perfect. This is a good, good collection of people. Right audience. Thank you. So if you've used RPM, what you're familiar with is front of the end product, the binary RPMs. So RPMs evolved from an earlier combination of systems in earlier versions of Red Hat Linux and some other distributions to provide a single queryable view of what binaries you actually have installed on the system, right? So you can do rpm-qa, you can see everything that's installed. If you want to install something new, you can do that. It's all done as a big block. Not only that, they're signed and they're verifiable. So Fedora signs their packages, Red Hat signs their packages. Any uh, sort of reasonable RPM distribution that I'm aware of does this. And you can update them. Uh, the one thing many of you, if you go back long enough, may be aware of is that RPM did not originally do automated resolution of dependencies. Uh, some of the other early distributions did that much sooner. Uh, it is a stigma that had been attached to RPM-based distributions for a long time, but I think that most people are now aware that we've resolved that originally with a tool called YUM, and uh, more recently we're moving to something called DNS. What builds these is uh, much more of the meat of RPM, which are source packages. So every binary package is actually built up from an RPM source package. The original thinking behind this and one of the key insights is that Linux distributions were pulling in upstream packages that weren't even necessarily focused on Linux. Many of them still aren't. And they were then adding a variety of patches to them. And it was import seen to be important, and I think still is, to preserve the source that came from the upstream project and cleanly separate it from the patches that were applied on top of it to make it appropriate for Linux. Some of, some of the times there's more of them, some of the times there are less. These days, you see, in some cases, there aren't very many at all. But 
at least you know what is upstream and what's been changed. And then we also encapsulate all of the processes necessary to take the resulting source and patch source and turn it into a binary package. We can characterize what's in that binary package. We can say these are actually executables. These are documentation components. And even more importantly, these are configuration files. So when you do an upgrade to HTTP, you don't overwrite your HTTP configuration. It stays there. Everything that you've done uh, is preserved. And a couple of other things, it does preserve a changelog. That's not required, but that's really a standard in all distributions. Um, it encapsulates, these builds can actually be done for multiple architectures, and we'll talk about that when we get to the build system as well. And it's all controlled via a spec file. Who has ever seen a spec file? And who has written one? Probably the same people who did. Okay, cool. So a spec file is divided up into a few sections here. Uh, we have metadata, like where the source came from, where the patches came from. We have information about the architecture it's meant to be built for, or whether it's architecture neutral description, and also things like its dependencies. So if you want to install something that requires X windows, it tells you that the X packages are required. You can also have dependencies that are build time dependencies. So you can say, I might need GCC. You don't necessarily need a compiler on a system if you want to run something that was built with C. But you do need it if you're going to build it. So all of that is in the preamble. And then these other steps, which actually, as we were talking about a second ago, encapsulate the process of actually going through the build. So unpacking the source, patching it, um, running autoconf with whatever arguments you want, running make, um, and then installing. And another thing that's actually, although this was not originally the case, has been the case for a long time, is that RPM installs to a staging area. So when you do the building of a source RPM, the content of that RPM ends up in a staging area, it's non-root, uh, and the binary package is constructed out of there, which necessitates the final relevant bit here, which is the file section. Uh, since you're not building as root, you can't necessarily create files that are owned by root or owned by other um, users that are not used, so you have to be able to say, this user bin sh binary really should be owned by root because it's going to be in the system. So these are the spec file components. I'm going to look at an actual spec file here. It's not the entirety of the spec file, but it's going to show some of the details of what are in it um, right now. And I've chosen uh, ZSH. I don't actually use ZSH, but I know a lot of people that are really fond of it. Uh, it is an interactive shell that's, oh, and this is kind of difficult to see. Uh, we'll just try. It's, it's okay. It's, it's good enough. So this is the preamble. We can see what the package is. We can see, and this, okay, that one part, this is a URL. I know you can't see it. You add, not only do you, do you see that this is the pristine source, it even tells you where it came from. We have a variety of patches. I cut out some of them. And, and then it has these things here, the build requirements. Right? So for example, although it uses end curses and probably is dependent on that at runtime, it needs the development libraries for end curses in order to be able to build. Then we have these prep sections. So this gets to something I forgot to mention there. RPM also has a very rich macro language. So a lot of the things that are standard for uh, particular builds are done not by actually writing them as scripts, but are done as macros. So setup-q, for example, is essentially telling it to untar that source package, that source tarball, and put it in an expected location. These tell you how to patch it. And then there's a, actually just one raw piece of shell here that's copying a portion of the source to another location. And then the instructions on how to build. So again, this uses a macro to run autoconf. Uh, and then just make all and make HTML. So all of these steps are actually done when you do an RPM build. And then the installation step. Again, we have the use of several macros. Uh, in terms of where things go, we are doing some variable substitutions with the names. All of this ends up in that staging location. And then we have a list of files that are in that staging location, and these are the parts of the actual package. Again, here's an example of one of, I think, the most relevant features, which is that a couple of these have been designated as configuration files, which means if you upgrade to a new version of this, they're not going to get overwritten. They're going to get preserved. And then we can see that uh, Dominic Hoff, is Dominic here, was the uh, person who did the most recent version of ZSH. So that's an RPM. Make sense? Good. That's all I got about RPM. Um, so. Fedora is a big collection of RPMs, and people are producing new ones of these all the time. One of the first tools we use to sort of aggregate that and maintain it is what we call diskget. So this is where the branching happens in that paragraph, that 60-second paragraph. It tracks uh, all of the content necessary to construct one of these source RPMs, but for multiple release streams. 
So we have a branch called, uh, called Rawhide, rather, which is the uh, constantly up-to-date version. Anybody can push new, well, I'm sorry, any package owner can push a new version into Rawhide that goes into the Rawhide branch of Distjed, uh, and they accumulate there. We now have one. This actually, you think, Matt, just happened for F22, is that correct? So we did do, F21 is the current actual release for F22. A branch has been created in the system that is distinct from Rawhide that is where F22 development is going to be. So there can be one package that is the most recent up-to-date version that people are using for testing in Rawhide, a completely different source RPM and set of sources uh, in preparation for F22, and it goes down the chain like that. There is also one for updates to released versions, I think going back to F20 at this point, would be the, or maybe F19, um, and sometimes soon older than that. But yeah. um, so what is captured in this? This is actually a Git repository, and the branches are real Git branches, if you're familiar with that. It's got the spec file, the patches, at, but it doesn't have the base sources. This is an interesting thing. So Git is not particularly good at handling big binary, pa binary files. So the one thing that you will not find in there are um, the base sources. They are handled in a slightly different way. Another thing it lets us do is have control of who can do what to what branch. So it's possible, for example, to have someone who is the maintainer for the version of ZSH that is in Fedora 20 but maybe they don't want to be keeping up to date with the new releases, so you can have a different person or collection of people uh, that do the release updates um, for newer versions. And in fact, did you want? Right. And actually, so this I don't. I unfortunately, don't have any slides on this. But there are even there's a big portion, actually, a very popular portion, of what Fedora does, which is to rebuild some of the packages in the Fedora package set for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That's called Apple. So you might have some people who do the Apple versions of these builds uh, and a different set of people who manage the versions for um, the Fedora releases. That's actually pretty common. Yeah, I am, an, I am the Apple maintainer for package for which I don't have upstream control, uh, as an example. Um, and I just, unfortunately, I don't talk more about Fed package, but uh, it's very rare for people to do the things that this does directly. It's usually assisted by um, a tool called Fed package, which unfortunately I, didn't, I don't have anything else to say about, other than it's great. Um, so this is an actual, this is ZSH, this is the same package I showed before, so you can see there are, there are branches for 2021, 20, 22, and master, there are actually even more, I just cut them out to make them fit on the slide. Uh, there, you can see that the spec file, the thing we looked at earlier, is there, some of the patches are there, in fact, uh, you'll have to take my word for it, but all of the patches are in there, but the tar file is not, instead there's this thing called sources. And sources says that the tar file, if you see a reference to this file in RPM, it is in fact in this sidecar storage area that's good for binary stuff, and it has this hash. So that all happens kind of nicely and automatically if you use fed package to put it in there. So that's great. We have a huge collection of source RPMs. They're managed in a sane way with disk git. Um, we have control over who can put things in there. Uh, what do we do? Where do we build it? Question, yes, please. Um, so when you actually, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't go into that level of detail on the RPM part. When you build a, an R, a source RPM is a single file that actually captures all of the, this all gets shrunk into the same file, and that itself can be signed. And then when you build it, the binary RPM is also another file. So these, these are the, the things that are in disk get are the, uh, the individual components that can be combined to make a source RPM. Uh, which is then a single file representation of that. Yes, sure. I oh yeah, I mean all of this is all of this for Fedora is public. You can see disk it as well. Yeah. I, yeah. Um. You. I don't think you. At the most, you need to be. You need to have a Fedora account. There's not a great um, GUI for disk it that I'm aware of. Boy, if, if Matt doesn't know, I don't feel bad about not knowing. So <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> we don't make any real effort to keep. I mean, you can't push stuff to it unless you're a package maintainer, but you can see all that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay, Matt can help you with that afterwards because I actually have a flight an hour and a half after the end of this presentation. So. <laughs> 
That's r oh yeah, of course, yes, that's what you mean. Become get a Fedora account. I'm going to talk about that at the end a little bit. Uh, probably should talk about it more. But anyway, so we end up with all these packages, but that we don't haven't actually talked about how they're built, right? So where do I build it? You build it in something called Koji, and Koji is awesome. If you use Fedora and you haven't looked at the Koji system, you're really missing out. Um, Koji is the is both the software and an implementation of that software that builds all of the packages in Fedora for every release and has done so for I think at least 10 years. So the infrastructure is large. It was even Matt didn't realize how large it was when I mentioned it at lunch. So for the primary architectures, which are uh, x86 and ARM, hard floating point, there are almost 100 machines in total. And there are actually multiple Kojis. There we have these architectures that are not primary, so PowerPC, 64-bit ARM, and S390, and each of those have their own Koji set up. So there are, for example, 10 mainframe slices that are available to do builds for Fedora. Question? So it's up to the Fedora, up to the packager to decide how often that they build. So you re every build is requested. Um, and then it goes, it's pushed in through Fedora Koji. So I actually have, um, I, th I think we manage uh, 5,000 package rebuilds every week. Um, or so it's, uh, sometimes it does sit relatively idle. There are times, though, when we want to rebuild everything. Uh, and in, in those cases, it becomes really helpful to have that many systems. I just thought, you know, I think a few of them are, vir some of them are virtual machines, but I, all the ARM stuff, for example, must be bare metal. There's really very little um, virtualization in ARM. So a little bit more about how Koji works, and I think in so sometimes Koji, if you're starting to try and use it, can be a little intimidating, and that's largely down to terminology. So Koji collects, a, when you do a package build, it ends up in a group a bucket or more than one, and they're called tags. Tags have inheritance, so you can have a, the tag for F21 inherits actually all of the old packages from previous Fedoras. And you can build in the sense that you have a build of yours has access to the content of one tag, so let's say F21 and all its updates, but the result of your build doesn't immediately go back into that set of packages. It can go somewhere else. And we call that a target, actually. So I have the examples I have down here, F20, some tags, which are entire collections of packages, are, say, F21 or F21 and its updates. But another tag is this thing with a fairly suggestive name of F21 updates candidates. There's a target called F21, Fedora 21, that builds against the content that is already accepted into Fedora 21 but then deposits the result of the build into something called updates candidates. So you don't immediately get into Fedora just because you've successfully built something. You go into another location, which we'll talk about in a second. Now the actual building is done with a tool called Mock. Has, who, who is familiar with Mock here? Raise your hand. Okay, good. So I, I can talk about it. Some of you. So Mock is a mechanism for taking whatever of the packages are necessary from the build portion of this target, so say F21 and its updates, and making those available to the RPM tools when they actually do a build. So, and it does this in a completely isolated root environment. So you do uh, ZSH, for example, there was that list of all the build requires. It will create a isolated root environment that contains those build requirements it will have installed those via YUM, and it will run the installation, or rather the compilation, in that environment, and then reap the results. So although our build system has hosts on it, those 100 hosts that I was trying to puff up earlier, uh, that may be at various versions, the actual builds of the software are done in this very controlled environment. So we know exactly what version of GCC was used, and what version of other libraries something was linked against, things of that nature. Any questions about that? So that I, you were you were most interested in that, Joe. Did that help you out? Good. <laughs> yeah, sure. I um, well, so the changes are always tracked in Diskit. The 
builders themselves, I've never seen one or gotten anywhere near one, even though I'm a Fedora contributor. It's, they're, they're extremely tightly controlled. So, in fact, they're not. And, and another thing to point out is that they don't, they don't have access to the Internet, generally speaking. The only thing that they're allowed to see is the content that's already in Koji, and that's par for partly for that reason as well. No one can sneak in something that says go out to this location and pull in some Trojan's code. Is that accurate, Matt? Yeah, okay. Oh, and so let us see if this, I, this may not render very well, but I do have the example of our standard test package here, which is, of course, it, the network probably won't work on demand, right, like this. All right, that's going to refuse to work. Well, if that had been at all legible or working, I could have shown you that a lot of the content that you saw in that source RPM uh, ends up being reflected in the build that is in Koji. And that actually happened, uh, this one was from, I think, June of last year was when that version of ZSH was built. We can see what it was built against. We can see the logs. We can see exactly what versions of the supporting packages went into it. All of that is visible in Koji. If it's a tagged package, essentially forever, so we're a big NetApp customer. Uh, they're fans of ours. Big Red Hat Studio. Yeah, well, he, yeah, and Sage was actually staring at me from the back of the room a moment ago. Um, so that's Koji. Once a build is done in Koji, that's, as I said, it's not actually automatically an update in Fedora. And for that, we have a couple of tools that work in conjunction with Koji to help us manage that. So that's PackageDB and Bodhi. So very briefly, uh, PackageDB is what establishes ownership, as I was talking about before. So some who, what pack, oh sorry, two things actually. Owner, what packages are actually in Fedora valid and who is allowed to do things to them. So it says ZSH is allowed and these are the people who are allowed to push updates for it for these various branches and versions. Bodhi provides a mechanism for people to give feedback on package updates that have been built. It does this both automatically through some other tools that we have that I didn't include in the presentation and manually through a system that we call just generally Karma. So if you have an update uh, and you want it to be pushed into updates and you want it to happen quickly, you can tell people to go out and test it. They can go to the Bodhi pages or use the Bodhi CLI and say, this is working for me, works for me, smiley face. And if you accumulate enough of this, uh, then the package is pushed as a proper Fedora update. Uh, word to the wise, you can actually change your own setting of how much karma a package needs, and you can set it as low as one, but not to zero. Um, so again, I was hoping to, I, I have a couple of screens for each of these, but since this isn't working, I'll, I'll skip over that part. Although the other thing, uh, uh, for certain categories of packages, uh, just spending enough time available as a testable update allows you to then request that it be moved into the proper updates. But so those are, those are still more components. Of At the end of this, we still have what is essentially a big pile of packages. We don't have a CD. We don't have a USB stick. We just have a bunch of packages that everyone has said are good and work. So what do you actually do with these? So there's, this is sort of the home stretch. These are the final set of tools that put it together and produce something that we can give out in the booth. Uh, and I think this captures the essential ones. So I'm sure Matt will again correct me. If I'm so we've got four things here. First is that we can go from these tags, these collection of packages, to repositories. And that's what the tool called MASH does. So it says, take everything that's in F21 or F22 and turn it into a YUM repository. Or take a certain subset of things that are in this inside of Koji and uh, sort of apply some rigor to them and end up with a YUM repository at the end of it. Uh, one relatively obscure thing that it does, uh, just touch on very briefly, is that for 64-bit, it has the intelligence to know which packages that are also 32-bit it should pull in. It's this multi-arc thing, if anyone's familiar with it. You may have noticed if you use 64-bit Fedora, you can, some of the 32-bit packages are available. MASH is the thing that actually determines which, which mirrored 32-bit packages should be in there, and it takes the steps to pull it in. 
Anaconda, who's, who knows what Anaconda is relative to Fedora? Okay, good. So if you install Fedora, or RHEL for that matter, um, Anaconda is the thing you see that actually does the install to put it on your system. So, or what? Or CentOS. That's right. Yes, we'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, Anaconda is almost as awesome as Koji. So it's a wonderful installation system. It's been developed over a long period of time. And it is the thing that actually understands how to set up a system to guide people through partitioning, anything you do, again, if you're familiar with installing it. Anaconda doesn't live in a vacuum. We actually, you notice when you boot a CD, you get a system that seems to be capable of running Anaconda, and that's what this tool, Lorax, does. So Lorax, taking that package set, is able to build a small bootstrap environment and create an ISO that's capable of running Anaconda. So you need, run, you need to run MASH to create a package set. The package set includes Anaconda. We run Lorax to create a boot ISO that has that package, and that, and that not yet, that does not have that package set on there. And finally, we use a tool called Punji or Punji. Okay, good. I didn't know either. Uh, that combines all of this to actually generate install media. So it takes an input file that looks a lot like a Kickstarter, if you're familiar with those, and it'll say, for example, on the server DVD, it should have these packages. And then it pulls via MASH, creates a, a repository. Via Lorax, it creates an, uh, a bootstrap installable environment, puts all of it onto a DVD ISO that we can then give away in the Fedora boot. And at that point, we have something that we might reasonably call a Fedora release. So we have some candidate sausage anyway. So go ahead. What's that? You, you give something that looks a lot like a kickstart file, actually. So it, uh, so it's a, it's a, it is ultimately, re really it is just a list of packages. The packages and package groups uh, that are defined elsewhere. Uh, and a few others. I mean, you also give it things like the name. That you, if it's the Fedora server spin, you actually give it the title that shows up on the splash screen in the top. So, uh, and then it does it does the rest. It actually generates a bootable piece of media. It's pretty cool. So, I had, this is not an Image Factory talk. Image Factory is a, another piece of software that I manage that that can automate running the resulting boot media. Thank you for the plug. Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do this next bit as much justice as it deserves, but as I said in the beginning, we have multiple iterations where we actually run through this entire process, end up with candidate media, and uh, you need to quality control that. It's, it's one of the best parts of the Fedora team, uh, and again, I wish, I wish I could speak to it in more detail. But basically, QA are the people who determine what the process is and the criteria are for calling something the alpha, beta, and gold releases. So they, this is all very objective. There are uh, specific release criteria. You can see them on the page. I have put a difficult to read link down there. Um, they decide when it's time to potentially request a compose to run through the process. Uh, and then they may, and then they take responsibility for running through tests and determining whether these release criteria have been met. As I say, they actually heard cats for doing actual testing. Do you have a, a notion of how many people participate in the QA testing for each? Okay. Hundreds, yeah. Um, and then they, along with uh, several of the other groups in Fedora, are the ones that actually determine whether uh, a given candidate is actually meets the release criteria, at which point they say, okay, this most recent RC that is the alpha, that is the beta, and then at the very end, if it meets all the criteria, it's the release. Um, I just pulled in a little, a few examples of some of the, the criteria at each step, just because I, th I think they're interesting. So you can see how they, they become progressive. So you go from something like the images must boot in the alpha stage, which seems pretty basic, to all of the translations, the backgrounds, and the final media must have the right um, uh, content and checksums and whatnot for final release. Another interesting point about this is simply that um, a lot of what they end up testing is related to the installer itself. I think Adam, who does this for Fedora, has for several releases said that over half of the criteria and the bugs that they find are actually related to the installer, not related to the packages, which is interesting because it means that the people who are funneling packages into Fedora are doing a lot of their own QA and testing to make sure that when a package that is not central to installation goes in there that it's actually working. Um, but it does also mean that it's the type of thing that's rather difficult to test in an automated way because it's related to uh, personal interaction with it. Why so alpha, beta, why alpha, beta, gold? I think, yeah. For everything? 
I think al alpha and beta release has always been. Yeah. yeah why did we stop it? Why did we start at be stop at beta? Right. Because we never need more than two test releases ever, in order to be. <laughs> no, that's a good. I remind me of, of the next iteration of this. I should say. RC. We, <laughs> we do actually. We we subclass them. Yeah. But it's an interesting cultural question. Why why do we say bug and why do we stop at beta? I don't know. I know the first one. I don't I don't know the answer to the second one. All right, so here it is. This is the Fedora release process again. I'm not going to say it again. Spare everybody the boredom. Um, there is another sausage. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Are you a fan of peanut butter Girl Scout cookies? Is that all right? Okay. I've dropped a few hints about the next sausage. Yes, there is another sausage. Thank you. How did you know? <laughs> You didn't see that. <laughs> yes. Does anyone know what this sausage? Uh, okay. Yeah. I, don't, I will give. Um, it's either going to be uh, for for our room sponsor here, or if someone can tell me the actual manufacturer of the canonical Chicago hot dog. Um, and there. Uh, lowercase C canonical. All right. Thanks, sir. It's Vienna beef. They have a great factory tour. They have a device that takes the plastic casing off of a hot dog and spits it out. It looks like a hot dog machine gun. It's amazing. Yeah, no, no. The they do put, we put poppy seeds, we put hot peppers. Um, I'm going to, okay. No ketchup, no. Oh, and celery salt. We were talking about celery salt earlier. Anyway, all right. I'm going to go through a few of these others. Um, I re actually, this is... A, Okay, we've got about. I'm actually butting up against my flight. That's great. Okay. Who here has heard of. <laughs> and there's a bar. Who here has heard of Red Hat Enterprise Linux? Great. Okay, perfect. Well, <laughs> I'm contractually obligated. No, I don't have a. Con I'm an at will employee like everyone. Um, there's a bit of mar mild marketing, and this is the closest I get to it here. But uh, RHEL is the uh, enterprise release of the operating system product from Red Hat. Um, it, and I, you know, I, I was unclear, some people were, how openly we're allowed to talk about this, and it turns out we're allowed to speak totally openly about this. There's even a page showing when this branching process occurred. So at some point, we take the package set from Fedora, uh, and then we begin to both winnow it down substantially and refine it and stabilize it. Um, I think the first, this product was originally called AS 2.1, Advanced Server 2.1, and is now called Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, but it came about at a time when uh, Linux was primarily competing with Solaris. And people thought, well, Linux is Red Hat Linux or SUSE or some of these other things that are releasing once every six months. They aren't supporting anything for more than two years. Um, that was completely unworkable for people who were using commercial Unix. So RHEL was a response to that. In the context of this presentation, the interesting thing to note is that most, much of the tooling that we use to produce RHEL is actually the same uh, as what is used to produce Fedora. First of all, the package set, obviously we start with the original package set and then start to refine it. Um, the core building uh, and this concept of having Git manage the sources, we use internally. That's exactly the same process. And we do use Koji. Um, we just call it something different for historical reasons, but it's all the same thing. A few things that we don't do the same. Um, we do not manage errata with, uh, we don't, I'm sorry, we don't manage package updates with Bodhi. We have this concept of errata. Um, we have an internal tool that helps us manage that. And we associate quite a bit more metadata with, with particular updates. Oftentimes it's things like which CVEs, which security uh, problems are addressed by a particular update. And we can group them together. And this then pushes out to a tool called Satellite, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, the specific Compose tooling is a little bit different. So Bodhi is not, I'm sorry, Hunji isn't used, Mash isn't used. There are a few other things that are different. Uh, and we have our own internal QA process. Question, Joe Brockmeyer. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the
question was, is there a, um, is there a way to keep this secret? The Koji, uh, if we have something like an embargoed security erata, can we keep the code that fixes that secret? We use Koji, but it's not the public Koji. It's an internal copy of it. So. Oh, can Fedora Koji do that? That's a good question. I don't know. Run a build. I had I'd started to prepare. I didn't finish it. I apologize. Um, examples of up two updates. Updates to two packages uh, that people will immediately know why they're relevant. One of the packages is Bash, and the other one was OpenSSL. Uh, and you can see this. One of the interesting, I mean, the, the Bash update was available very quickly, uh, the Koji build was. So, question, yeah. I am going to talk about Atomic at the very end. So, um, CentOS. Who here has heard of CentOS? Cool. So apologies for all the hand raising stuff. It's just a nice, keeps up a ca cadence. Right. You're supposed to do the hey. Hey. No, I can't. I couldn't possibly do that in front of the master, <laughs> the the true strongest geek, uh, Ruth. So um, <laughs> CentOS is a community rebuild of RHEL. So it's been around, I think, almost as long, or in some, uh, possibly once under a different name, almost as long as RHEL has been around. So. Although RHEL is a commercial product, we do release the sources uh, not only because we want to, but because we're obliged to via the licenses. Um, and people rebuild that and produce their own version of binary version of this. Um, they have a, a the, the core, what they call the core of CentOS, for which the goal is to maintain as little difference with RHEL as possible. And interestingly, because the and the, and that b goes down to the level of they don't want the package name version and release or file name to differ, if at all possible. Uh, and interestingly, this conflicts with some of the workflow for all of the tooling, at least up to the Koji point that I talked about. So the CentOS community, first of all, they don't have a single build process that they've used uh, release after release after release, um, nor do they uh, feel that that's necessary because they're actually working towards the goal of having the same names and minimal differences, so they just iterate over that process until uh, the packages look the way they want, and then they take that build with that particular name. Uh, and release it. They do have some components that are not in RHEL. Um, this uh, was originally just called Extras and was relatively small. I think the most notable thing that they've done, uh, RHEL 6, if I'm not mistaken, no longer supported the Zen hypervisor, Zen virtualization, but CentOS 6 in the Extras capacity actually has Zen support, so they've pulled that in. And that has actually evolved into a larger concept that's really growing as we speak. Uh, of this notion of SIG, special interest groups. So uh, the way I'm putting it here, what, what did I mean by that? Stable but tweakable base? Okay, right, so you want to use most of what's in CentOS, which corresponds mostly to what's in RHEL, but you want the ability to change pieces of it that we might not otherwise change with uh, inside of RHEL because of stability concerns or release cadence. So uh, OpenStack is an example of a SIG, so they have uh, RDO builds on top of CentOS, but they have the right, or they reserve the right to change a small portion of it, and that's something that we wouldn't normally do inside of RHEL. Uh, Atomic is another SIG, is it not, if I'm not mistaken? Um, so this is the idea that there are there are groups that want, that are very rapidly changing upstreams that actually want their operating system base to be relatively stable. Yes, question? This is true, and in fact, I uh, I work f I'm part nominally of the CentOS team internally, and yes, while well, all of the core um, CentOS developers are uh, have have joined Red Hat, we've, we've, what what is the terminology we're using? Thanks. We pay them. <laughs> um, I think there may be one or two people. Who oh, well, that's uh, it, a large group of the core developers are now Red Hat employees, or as Ruth said, we pay them. Um, I mean, interestingly, there's not that much to own about CentOS, right? I think the only the only actually concrete thing that that changed hands there may have been the trademark. But certainly, in terms of the social relationships and the real core of what open source development is all about, we're now quite a bit closer than we were 
It has all the pu it has all the public details. So the other answer was apparently go go look at the press release. So, but yes, the short answer is yes. Um, OpenSUSE. OpenSUSE is, an, is, I would say, the other major RPM-based distribution. I had a great conversation with one of the core OpenSUSE developers in the lead-up to this talk. Um, one thing I had forgotten is that OpenSUSE used to be SUSE, and that SUSE used to have a, re a sort of interesting release model, where they would, their, uh, the lead-up to release, they were closed. And then they would release it, and then the source and everything became open. Um, they don't do that anymore. Now they have a model that I think is much, much more closely mirrors the relationship between Fedora and RHEL. Um, SUSE has their own build system, and uh, they call it OBS, the open build system. And it, it actually, it's very interesting to see how closely the individual components of it are similar to some of the things I talked about earlier. Um, one of the key differences, at least to me, is that it provides a, unif a single unified infra interface to some things that exist as very distinct and discrete tools inside of Fedora. So we have Koji, for example, and you can see those builds, but there's not, no screen inside of Koji. There's nothing inside of Koji where someone can comment on the results of the build. That is done in an entirely different interface. That's done in Bodhi. OBS combines some of these things into a sort of single interface. Um, it also has something that we, we don't do uh, inside of Fedora which is that they have uh, the ability to trigger cascading builds if you've changed a package that is a dependency, a build time dependency for other packages. So if there was, in the ZSH example, I don't know how actively an NCurses is being developed, but if there was an NCurses change, you could tell OBS that you wanted it to trigger builds of everything that was dependent. On that, it would rebuild ZSH, among other things. They also have a very interesting, and this was actually mentioned in the, in the blurb at the beginning of the talk, um, they have an automated QA system called OpenQA that primarily tests the interactive install of OpenSUSE, and it does this by actually simulating the key presses that an individual would do when they are doing the installation. And it can then look for um, particular subsections of the screen. There's a great demo that the OpenSUSE guys do about this uh, that need to be present and fail them if they're not, and then it'll show you exactly where that failure occurred. Joe. Susie Studio. So um, I think it's a, this is a pop culture reference, probably. Um, so <laughs> Joe pointed out that they also have something called Susie Studio, where you can click a button and produce your own version of the distribution, essentially, your own install media, or your own um, VMs, whatever. So that's cool. Um, and they use OpenQA. There was a, uh, I'm, not, I'm blanking on the name now. Talk at Fosdem about how they're using OpenQA to have essentially a rolling release, which is a similar to our Rawhide in Fedora, but that has been tested at every point uh, by pushing the stuff through OpenQA. I'm, that's the tumbleweed label, yeah. So they had something called Factory, which was the direct analog to Rawhide. Tumbleweed was meant to be this rolling release, and I now the two have essentially merged, so, yeah. And we admire that, and I'm, mention I'm saying this publicly in front of the Fedora project lead to light a fire. Yay. Let's start looking at OpenQA. There was a question in, question in the back. Yes. Oh, here. Yeah. That is the last one I was not aware of, but yes, I had heard room. They did mention that they have at least an initial set of tests, bless their hearts, even for Fedora and for CentOS, so that they're running through OpenQA. What's that? Yeah. Cool. So against all expectations, I only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to...
I, I do want to do, uh, again, I had a nice conversation about Debian. I'm going to admit, I, I have never been a Debian user. I have installed it a few times, but I, and all this time I haven't been a Debian user, but I did want to give it a little bit of, a little bit of its due. Um, a quick comment about the differences between, so Debian uses a different packaging system called dpackage. All of the discrete components in RPM, all of the things that motivated it, are in fact dealt with in dpackage as well. They, you have the concept of pristine sources, you have the concept of um, uh, driving how you patch the system, how you, how you put patches into it, how you actually run the build, and what the resulting files are. The most interesting thing to me as someone who had not looked at it in detail before, and to contrast with RPM, is that it, it was much less prescriptive than RPM is in, in some areas. So the component in dpackage that drives the build is just a make file. It can contain literally anything. And then over time, they have evolved a series of, in some cases, competing products, projects rather, to streamline that so that the end result is something that looks more like what I showed in the RPM spec file. Um, they have a system that is roughly analogous to Koji called BuildD, so it builds for uh, multiple environments. One interesting thing that's definitely different uh, is that package maintainers in Debian can upload not only a source package, but at least one binary build of their source package when they submit it, uh, which is something that uh, ever since, certainly since the introduction of Koji, Fedora has not allowed. Um, and they pointed out there's at least one case where this is really useful, which is a somewhat obscure one, but let's say you have uh, QMU, which is an emulator, and you've got it running, um, the emulator for MIPS and you want to compile the BIOS code, the bootloader code for MIPS so that you can run a MIPS bootloader on QMU. Although the result is a package that you'd like to be able to install anywhere, it's essentially architecture neutral because you want to be able to emulate MIPS on ARM or i386 or anything. You have to compile it on a very specific piece of hardware. So they let people compile stuff and upload it, uh, upload architecture neutral packages uh, that have been compiled on a specific architecture. The other th quick thing, I wanted to do more statistics in terms of number of packages and whatnot, but Fedora and Debian, I think, are the largest public distros um, by a good margin. Uh, they have, uh, Fedora has about 20,000 source packages, which corresponds to over 30,000 binary packages, and I think Debian has a little over that, something like 25 or 30,000 source packages, corresponding to about 40,000 binary packages, so quite large. I apologize if your favorite distro was not in there. Uh, Ubuntu is great. I just couldn't get enough information about how they work on it. Arch, uh, Gen2, any others? Shout them out really quick so we can. Atomic. Oh well, that's those are the two. Things. Mandriva, Mandriva. Thank you. Uh, a couple of very things, and again, I'm I'm running short on time here. So uh, Matt is going to do a great presentation, uh, actually, in the very next slot on something called Fedora Next. And one component of Fedora Next is this idea that 30,000 binary packages is an awful lot of packages. Um, and that applying the same standards to all of them is probably doesn't make a lot of sense and that perhaps we should start thinking about um, having a core group of packages that get perhaps the open QA treatment. Uh, there's certainly a case for open 2 say they don't open QA everything all the time. They open QA core set and work out. Um, another thing that is a sort of a, an analog or complements the idea of Koji is this is I think it's been about a year and a half this which is called Copper. Copper is a build system but it's not a build system that applies any of the rigor or um, release-based metrics or processes that are associated with Koji and Disjit and all of that release process. So anyone, I think you do have to have a Fedora account, but once you have it, you can push a variety of source packages into it, do builds, do them against multiple targets, and have a sort of isolated repository of your own uh, that contains these, this software, and you don't necessarily have to interface with the Fedora release process or even the Fedora approval process until you're ready. Another thing sort of loosely related to this is software collections are not going to do this justice, but essentially another element of Fedora and RHEL is that there's a single official version of a lot of packages. There's, you know, w we have some ways to work around this which are a little bit messy, but you know, what if I want to have three different Ruby runtimes or five different Java runtimes on my system? That is very difficult. Software collections is an attempt to fix that. And there are a few other ways of non, uh, providing non-core package sets. SIGs in the CentOS world are looking at doing something similar where we would have different collections that might override components uh, and have different versions. All right. Atomic, Cloud, Docker, you asked about this. So Joe, when you did a talk, you can look for Joe Brockmeyer's talk from yesterday. 
going into Project Atomic in great deal. Atomic is related to this idea of Docker. So a lot of what we have inside of Fedora and the Fedora package's interdependencies assume that when you install all of these systems on there, you want a full booting runnable system. If any, who's heard of Docker containers? Surely, almost everybody. Containers are this idea that you run a sort of small mini system, but within the running kernel uh, of an already running OS. And it turns out that you don't need nearly as many of the packages uh, that are inside of a core system if you're running Docker. This has been something of a challenge in the Fedora products, project, rather. It's very, it's been hard for us to deconstruct what is necessary to, for example, just run HTTP. It, you end up with a system that has a kernel, a system that has a lot of um, you know, runtime management. Um, so that is, that's something that I think we're really only just starting to grapple with uh, in the Fedora package set. Project Atomic is um, something that lets you run Docker containers on top of a very minimal and very and atomically upgradable and downgradable system underneath it. So Atomic, very briefly, lets you set, specify a set of RPM packages and generate an alternative media for installing a full RPM-based system. So you say, I want just Docker and some of the Docker management stuff. You generate this repository, this um, tree, as we call it, the compose tree, and then you install that as your system. If you want to do an upgrade, you do an upgrade to that remote uh, compose tree. So you say, I want the next version of Docker, I want the next version of Kubernetes, some of these management tools. Uh, you can then, on the running system, upgrade atomically. Say, I want to update the system, not these RPMs, but the whole running system to this next version. You reboot into that. And if it doesn't work, you can go back to what was working before in its entirety. Similar to a product that I've heard of called CoreOS, yes, <laughs> maybe. But, but, right. And then the idea being that you would run most, most, this is a very lean system that just runs the containers, and then the container content is obviously changeable on top of that. Uh, so that's Atomic. Joe, if you're more, more interested in that, Joe can answer questions, I would say after the break. Joe is the leader of the Atomic SIG for the CentOS project, among other things. Um, where can I help? Well, I'm going to end up running. Make your own sausage. So um, I would encourage everybody to learn how to do packaging in particular in the distro that you favor. In fact, learn it in both. I, oddly enough, I find very few people who are packagers for both um, RPM and DEB. And uh, so I think that would be a highly marketable skill, actually. Um, I would certainly value it in an interview. Um, inside of Fedora and, in fact, CentOS, and I think Debian as well, you can, uh, you know, they're always looking for people to help man maintain packages. So there is even an official list of orphaned packages in Fedora, so packages no longer have a maintainer. Um, and, of course, if you actually have a favorite piece of software that isn't in Fedora, which is hard to believe that it's not in those 20,000 source of RPMs, but maybe it isn't, uh, you can create your own. And of course, testing. Uh, I did. I feel like I gave a short shrift to the QA group, but if you want to, these test days are all outlined very clearly on the Fedora Wiki. The test criteria, the scheduling for all of that is done. If you can test a package or participate in QA, that would be great. So what Matt said, that, and something I didn't touch on in detail, is that when you do a, a potential update, it ends up in a repository that you can optionally enable called updates testing. So if you're brave or helpful, uh, enable that, look for updates and do them. Or brave or helpful, or brave and helpful, do that. So I wanted to acknowledge a few, our charcutiers, this is a real term here, um, is one who makes charcuterie, you help me with this. So Adrian uh, is from the OpenSUSE project, is responsible for all the correct details and whatever I said about it, but I'm responsible for anything that was wrong. Uh, Don Armstrong is one of the people in the Debian booth who was extremely helpful uh, in talking through some of the details there. Adam Williamson, Fedora QA manager, Matt Miller, Fedora project lead, and Dennis Gilmore, who I hope I didn't spell his name wrong. QA monkey, and then Joe and Gina. Uh, Jenna, gosh, darn it, when I, it's every time I see it. Joe and Jenna, um, for helping me out. Any questions in the next two minutes? Yes, sir. Um, 
Well, I mean, there is a rolling distribution of Fedora. Um, that I, the thing I touched on at the very beginning, Rawhide, uh, is the result of all the builds that are done on a nightly basis. In fact, we could do it more frequently. So this tooling, uh, and actually Jenna advised me to wrap up with this, so I'm afraid I neglected to do that, uh, is entirely appropriate for rolling distributions. And in fact, I think our hope is to do, as I said, introduce more QA uh, into the Fedora process and do something like that. So I would say, it relates directly to a rolling distribution because, in a sense, it is the rolling distribution of Fedora, which is Rawhide. Right, and in I run Rawhide. A lot of a lot of the people, uh, Dennis advocates that everybody run Rawhide, which is great. He's definitely that's the ultimate in dog fooding. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I think it does, and I think OpenSUSE is the one that I'm aware of that has done, uh, has I think the most Im impressive version of this right now with what they're trying to do with Tumbleweed. Um, it changes it only in the sense that they call something a release and claim that it's stable more frequently, whereas Fedora calls something a release every six to 12 months, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they do. The yeah, for a subset of the packages, right, but yeah, to keep it. Thank you all very much. I got to run. <laughs> or stay another night in LA.